Wow, that's pretty epic music. Thanks, everybody, for joining for today. I just want to continue spinning that music as we kind of go through here. Uh, welcome aboard. My name is Dean Parsons, and we have a ton of content for you today. I'm joining you from Newfoundland, Canada, and Tim is going to be joining us as well from an awesome place. We're going to do introductions soon, but I'll pass it over for Tim to say hi as well. Hello, Tim. Good morning, everybody, and good afternoon, plus 0.5, Dean, in your Newfoundland time zone, where you're not aligned with any other part of North America. Um, I am in Salt Lake City and up in the mountains, enjoying some beautiful weather here. Um, I am Tim Conway with uh, the Sands Institute over the Industrial Control System Curriculum. And, and Dean, just for clarity, that is you in the picture behind you, correct? Yes, that's correct. Uh, this is not an industrial control system, but it is a control system of sorts, tiny one. This here is my jet ski over the lake here where we live. And if you look really, really close and zoom in real far, you can actually see me holding a controller, flying a drone while I get that picture. So uh, pretty awesome times, pretty awesome times. Yeah. Is, like is in that the approach controls. of getting like a moonshot around the moon so you can get enough speed to get across the ocean? <laughs> that's it. That's exactly <laughs> it. <laughs> exactly. That's it. So yeah, the idea is awesome. just like ICS security, right? <laughs> Flying a drone and jet skiing, it's juggling a whole bunch of things at the same time. <laughs> uh, so quick background on myself, I'll pass it to Tim for some introductions and background on him, and, and him as well. Um, I'm a certified SANS instructor. I teach ICS 515, which is a technical course in industrial control system, incident response, and visibility. You'll hear the word from Tim later, visibility, because that's one of the five controls he'll kind of uh, speak to. Uh, so I teach that class, but I'm also the co-author and instructor for ICS 418, which is a management level class, a two-day class for management for those coming into ICS or in the place already managing control systems, cyber risk, and threats to control systems. Uh, Tim, what's the background you have? Hey, um, so I am with the SANS Institute from the industrial control system curriculum side. I am in the curriculum lead position. So I get to work with all of our awesome instructors and uh, get to help create, help birth each one of our ICS courses and working with the author team that we have. It has just been a wonderful experience. I'm going on 11 years here. So I uh, get to work with folks like Dean and Robert M. Lee and Justin Searle and Jeff uh, Shear and Jason Dealey and a whole cast of characters across, across the world, um, working with industrial control system customers everywhere we go. And uh, Dean has been with me for, boy, I think six or seven weeks over the last couple of months. So he's got to be sick of hearing my voice and staring <laughs> at my face. But uh, we also get to go out and do awesome, fun things uh, with ranges and exercises outside of a traditional classroom. So uh, we keep busy and we keep uh, keep moving around the world as much as we can. Practical, hands-on, actionable things, which is what we're going to give you today. And as Tim mentioned, as we travel around the world, I'm looking at the comments here. People are coming in from all over. Hello from India. Hey, another Canadian. Hello from Ontario out there as well. Mexico City. <laughs> a lot of folks from all over, as we're seeing. Uh, we're also seeing a ways for to for you to connect with Tim and myself on LinkedIn as well as a team in the background running this awesome magic show is all dropping in LinkedIn links for our profiles and so on. Even folks- Dean, Dean this is when, when we get to highlight on the fact that I know nothing about geography. <laughs> we just get on the plane. We I only wonder on. where in the world they could be. <laughs> hey, someone from Singapore just joined. We've been there together. That's awesome. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, just before I uh, pass it over uh, to Thomas in a few moments there to introduce uh, a little bit about what he's going to talk about with the Sense uh, News Bites, I do want to suggest as well that I see someone from the UK will be in the UK soon, actually in March for the UK Summit, an ICS Summit in March. And, and that's the first one we've done that's ICS in London. So folks in that region, we're really excited to kind of be there with you folks, uh, you know, new and experienced uh, in ICS. So really looking forward to that event. Um, so what I do in, is... We've been in CFP mode for one event after the next, whether it's the UK ICS Summit in oh. London or the Munich ICS event uh, in May that is taking place. I think the CFP just closed on that. And uh, I believe we still have an active CFP open if anybody's interested for ICS Summit in Orlando. We have uh, three ICS events in different parts of the world one CFP closing after the next. Fantastic. And the one in June, that's uh, the one in Orlando you mentioned. That's the ICS Summit in June there. 
At Disney, yeah, yes. Like, three, awesome. At Disney, which which is cool because I find that people will leave class in the evenings and go to Disney and have fun and realize that when they're on in the park, they're actually riding control systems. So like hopefully they're <laughs> yeah. thinking about, oh, well, how do we protect this if it was ours? Yeah. What if something went wrong with this? <laughs> <laughs> safety, safety, safety. Yeah. Um, so what I'll do now is Tim and I are going to introduce Thomas. He's going to come on shortly in about a minute or less. There he is. He's coming in right now into the studio. And he's going to talk to you guys all and uh, folks all about the top news stories for cybersecurity. And I believe, I hope so, it's important to talk about some ICS related events as well. Thomas, over to you, sir. That's right. Dean, Tim, thanks a lot. Hello, cybersecurity news fans, and welcome to Wait Just an InfoSec News Bites. I'm your host, Thomas Wolf. And in keeping with this theme's week, this week's theme of industrial control system security, I have two great ICS related stories for you this week. In the first story, CISA has created new guidance for water, the water sector. The guide is to help water and wastewater utilities beef up their response to cyber attacks. Now this is in response to the increasing number of critical infrastructures being attacked. It's a 27 page guide, which is nice. It's not one of those thousand page tomes that are so frequent in the industry. It emphasizes developing effective incident response playbooks, as well as best practices for reporting cyber incidents. Some other key aspects include things like increasing collaboration and just giving utilities cybersecurity resources. Now, most water and wastewater utilities operate on tight budgets and the, and the smaller utilities, they don't even have the cybersecurity expertise oftentimes. And instead what they do is prioritize infrastructure maintenance over cybersecurity. Now this is all changing and CISA is helping that. CISA advises utilities to take the time to prepare for the incidents before they happen. It gives other advice like uh, improving detection capabilities, uh, planning for containment and recovery, and creating post-incident playbooks. You know, lessons learned are always good to inform you know, future potential incidents. And in our last story, uh, Schneider Electric is in the news. I, they are a major energy management and automation corporation. They were targeted by a ransomware attack known as Cactus. Um, corporate data from Schneider's sustainability business division was stolen, and it also disrupted some of their cloud platform, um, which led to ongoing outages. The ransomware gang stole terabyte bytes of corporate data and is threatening to leak if they don't get a ransom. Uh, Schneider's sustainability business division provides consulting services to companies like Clorox, DHL, DuPont, uh, Hilton, Lexmark, Pepsi, Walmart. So huge corporations uh, could be potentially affected by this. Um, that data could include the customers of sensitive information, uh, all sorts of different kinds of information from um, their electricity usage to uh, industrial control systems data. Uh, the Cactus ransomware operation has been effective since March of last year. And also of note, Schneider, and we covered this story several months ago, Schneider Electric was previously targeted in the move it data theft attacks by the CLOP ransomware gang. And those are your SANS News Bites for the week. For more cybersecurity news, don't forget to subscribe to the SANS News Bites newsletter at sans.org backslash news bites. Thanks again. I'm your host, Thomas Wolf. Have a great week, folks. Dean, back to you. Tim? Awesome. Thank you. Thanks so much, Thomas. As you've gone through those events, there's a couple things that kind of rang through keywords. There are things like detection, things like industrial controls, and things like, uh, I'll say, prioritization. So anybody on the call can go out and get an ICS, I'll say, uh, assessment, which is a good thing to do if the person or people doing it has ICS background and experience. But the question is going to be, well, how do you prioritize what the gaps are? Which gaps do you attack first? Uh, so Tim is probably going to have you covered as he's going to he's going to cover something shortly on that. But I also heard that water and budget, low budget, water being attacked. There's other ICSs out there as well with low budget or no budget. And I think that mature organizations are seeing that the business, the ICS, the control systems really need attention because of the threat level and the catastrophic failure that's possible as a result of an attack. So um, while budgets might be necessary, I would say, and I say this in every class and in the field, is that the industrial control systems, while it might be daunting to look at, there's ways to prioritize the gaps. And even with a low budget, you can do a lot of great things quickly. 
Uh, so with that, uh, I want to give it back over to Tim. We're going to guide you into, I think the first thing is the question of the week, and then we're going to get into our slides. So if you were in the ICS sector today and you have a 2024 ICS security plan, where would you focus your time? This is where on screen you can join in Slido and enter that number or hit the QR code with your phone. And the idea here is we want to give you a little bit of time to understand what those options are and then give us your thoughts on those. Tim, do you think any of these are of value, of use? What's your thoughts? Train so your people. Train <laughs> your people. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. If nothing else, train your people. <laughs> That's a really good point. I no think matter if, what you buy, no matter what you employ, if you don't have people who care and feed for it and know how to use it, it's going to just be another thing that you bought that eventually goes away. 100%. I, uh, I definitely like the remote access piece, though, as we look through case studies of events that have happened around the world impacting industrial control systems and critical infrastructure. Every one of them ends up having some alignment with uh, remote access or third party connectivity, something along those lines. Of course, everything leans on each other like dominoes. So this was very well put together. And the responses that come in from people, there won't be a right or a wrong answer there will be a, where are you in this process? Meaning at your organization, if you have already implemented multi-factor authentication and looked at all your points of remote connectivity and strengthened those and removed the old legacy systems, and now you're moving on to the next thing and the next thing, it just means you're at a different part in that, uh, in that journey and that effort than uh, someone else who might be high prioritizing remote access or training staff. I 100% agree here. And I think it, it, it took us some time to figure out which question of the week to ask because of that. There are organizations that nuclear, as an example, they're probably very mature in many cases, very mature in their ICS journey. And maybe there's utilities that are not quite, not quite there. Uh, so uh, these questions were hard to come up with. Doing all of them may not make sense right now, given you might have some done or the budget is not going to allow some things with lower return of investment. Uh, I'm agreeing with Tim 100% that if you train the folks, regardless of what tools you have, you can at least do something with what's already available in your network. So that's a really good kind of approach. As I'm looking to people online as well, um, they are participating in the uh, poll, which is good. Some people from Turkey as well, Romania. There's some former students in here as well that say hi to both Tim and I as well. So it's so great to see you folks come back for more of this. This is really good. Greetings from Virginia as well, Berlin. Uh, another Canadian from Alberta. Welcome aboard. Fantastic. South so Carolina. Even. <laughs> <laughs> We're all cold right now. It's seriously <laughs> super winter. So <laughs> my last six months, I've had Dean and Jason Dealey on one side or the other at some meeting or presentation. I've been surrounded by Canadians. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of maple syrup and really bad hockey jokes all day. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> yeah. Very kind and very friendly. <laughs> Excellent. So I wonder if we can see uh, the overall details here. Right now, the winner for sure is train the teams in ICS specific incident response. That's a great idea. Looking down through as well, enable multi factor authentication for remote systems, as Tim mentioned, a great aspect as well. One thing I was expecting to see as a higher percentage here, which I think is a lot of value, is the one right on the bottom, which is incident response exercises. So tabletop exercises that are uh, engineering driven. And, and I, Tim will also agree here, and I think there's a, there's a reason why, but I think one of the things I've seen in the field is if organizations do that, it does a several things at once. High return of investment. So running a tabletop provides you the ability to understand who in the teams will be responding, who in the engineering side or IT or wherever will be responding. It also creates the sense of, well, do we actually have a way to respond to the engineering systems for recovery from PLC, ladder logic, remote terminal to configurations, protection control configurations, which may not be, I'll say, in scope for many general IT security incident response tabletops. So hopefully we can see that moving forward. But as Tim mentioned, there's no wrong answer here. Uh, Tim, do you have any other I thoughts? Will say on this the, we, we were a little devious in the, in the uh, construction of your possible answers, meaning running an incident response exercise is training. So it's one of the most uh, in-depth training you can get into if you're actually working through threat-based real-world scenarios that have happened that are impactful to your sector. And you're walking through your policies, your procedures, your uh, what kind of uh, response steps would be during an event if it should happen to you. So 
looking at something that happened. So in the news report, the, uh, the reporting from Schneider, every other industrial control system vendor, if they hadn't already had their own version of that, they should be looking at what Schneider is doing and what happened from the ransomware group and start exercising. What does that look like for them? How would they detect it? How would they find out about it? How would they communicate it to their customers? What would they do in working with that group? Um, there's a number of different organizations that do nothing but ransomware response and ransomware mitigation at this point. So your incident response exercises and practice should involve engaging them and working through what that would actually look like when that day comes. Uh, hopefully it never happens, but um, working through an IR prep like that as real world as possible using case studies against yourself, that is training. Um, so we could probably combine those two percentages to make training even bigger, Dean. Agreed, agreed. <laughs> we're good there. I think we're all <laughs> we're on the right track. So looking at those that the, the statistics that we have here, we're gonna we're gonna go in now to our slide deck and really talk about the predictions for this year. So this is really the crux of what Tim and I are trying to bring to this community today: the 2024 ICS or OT cybersecurity predictions. Ooh. We also built in a couple uh, common questions that we get, and I don't want to spoil it, but that's coming up in a minute there. I want to transition this over to Tim to guide us through this deck, and this is really talking about critical infrastructure. So, Tim, let's uh, let's uh, go from your end. Sure thing. Yeah, as you look at this slide, it, depending on what part of the world you're in, your view of this may be different. So our, our friends from Singapore, you have your 11 sectors, uh, those coming in from uh, the EU, you have your NIST-2 and 18 uh, that you've grown to now with NIST-2. As you look towards the U.S. version of this, and uh, we're looking at uh, these 16 sectors. We used to be 18, just like the EU, and we moved to 16. Um, you look at these 16 sectors, and you think about the IT components of each one of these sectors and each organization that uh, was represented there. And important to note uh, the OT components here. So the IT pieces, how they manage the business, very, very important. Um, otherwise, there wouldn't be a business. And then the other side, the OT components, the why they're a business from the perspective of critical infrastructure, um, the production of megawatts, moving them out into an electrical system, the moving of molecules and natural gas, the chemical sectors, everything that is done on this slide has both an IT and an OT component. And I know we have people joining us today that are from one world or the other. And uh, they may even be from kind of small municipalities or co-ops where they're sort of a little bit of both. And it's super important that these teams continue to find ways to work together and leverage one another's skill sets and uh, really just focus on kind of that diversity that's necessary in defending these systems. Because certainly as we look to the attack teams, they are sharing information and working very, very well together from one campaign to the next or from one uh, targeted uh, attack to the next. Do you have anything to add here, Dean? No, I think you nailed it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to try to get a resource as you're presenting, Tim, and uh, maybe we can drop it in the comments on some of the differences between IT and ICS so folks can learn those differences to collaborate better with engineering staff and IT staff. Otherwise, let's back over to you, sir. Yeah, we can, we can uh, give them another 30 second sound bite of if those two words aren't super clear in your mind of one or the other, and you think IT, think of data in different states, and you'll hear this in a bunch of different SANS courses or training that you should take anywhere or in university. As you think of data at rest sitting in a, a file system or in a storage, think of data in use in an application set and processor, and think of data in motion moving across a network infrastructure through firewalls, through routers, through switched environments. Those fall under the IT information technology uh, kind of way of thinking. As you move into the operational technology, Think of data that does something or means something. So it's representing the state of something in the field, or it allows you to manipulate the state of a process that's under control. So kind of uh, thinking of data in two different ways between the information technology and the operational technology side. Uh, just before I go to the next slide here for you to present, there is uh, someone in the comments asking about cloud and what our thoughts are on cloud. There is a risk coming up in cloud. Maybe you can address it as you go through your presentation. Yeah, these are certainly, um, as we look to 2024 and we start to highlight people working in industrial control systems and kind of across those critical infrastructure that we just highlighted. And we say, what, what things are emerging 
and those answers may be different per sector. So Thomas talked about uh, ongoing campaigns and attacks against the water sector. This slide might look different for the water sector in the United States than it does for chemical or that it does for the electric sector. And if you think of the electric sector, they've been doing a number of things and have been heavily regulated from a cybersecurity perspective for over two decades. Where the water sector, you can start to feel that 2024 is going to be a year where that starts to become a reality. And certain size utilities are gonna be looking at moving beyond just recommendations and guidelines and into some level of requirements. And over time, you'll start to see rail moving in the same direction. And just after the Colonial Pipeline, we started to see things like that happening with natural gas transmission. So each sector may have a different view of this. So where they would place themselves on the regulation risk, for example, they, depending on sector, they may put themselves more in a high risk, high impact of the organization that they need to do something, or there may be penalties or problems or worse, there may be an actual cyber attack. So as you think of yourself, wherever you are in the world, each one of these lines may be different based on geography and sector. But as we look at the entire industrial control system space in the community, we are definitely seeing more targeted malware introduction, industrial control system malware uh, frameworks that can be modularized and different components brought in based on specific targets, based on specific devices and specific protocols. Think of it like a Swiss army knife where you can pull out whatever tool you might need for a particular task and start to assemble those different components, whether they're, again, industrial control system protocols or devices or a specific goal you're trying to achieve uh, on an attack target. So that top item, targeted malware is of great concern we do not have, like in the IT space, thousands and hundreds of thousands or millions of different malware samples that we're staring at and facing all the time. Rather, we have a couple of very novel tools that have been introduced and used in attacks around the world that we have to learn a lot from because they can be modified quickly. And in many cases in an industrial control system, having access is the vulnerability that's being exploited. Um, the devices that are being targeted and attacked are unauthenticated, unencrypted. They are built for operational purpose. So when an attacker targets them and manipulates them, they don't necessarily need to bring all kinds of unique tooling. So we have to learn from what we've seen. To Dean's point on the industrial cloud integration, this is something that um, you normally, from an industrial control system and critical infrastructure perspective, you hear cloud and you hear control and you hear critical infrastructure and your head starts shaking, no. But in reality, we have to start thinking about this in a number of different ways, whether it's information that is being moved into the cloud from different critical infrastructure asset owners and operators, that has largely happened. So data that needs to be protected and finding ways to deal with that and manage that as you move to non-real-time data from a forecasting or a planning or a, a predictive maintenance and scheduling, that in many sectors is starting to be looked to the cloud as an opportunity to leverage. And then the last bucket where we say control from the cloud. There are some sectors as we think uh, offshore wind or renewables or very remote oil fields and you start to understand for some of those implementations, they are moving towards control in the cloud from a different perspective. They're moving to it from a safety perspective, um, keeping people out of harm's way. And you will start to see different vendors that have enabled their tools to do that, where we now have uh, control system vendors for large scale energy management systems that are looking to cloud-based control and cloud-based solutions but uh, largely from the energy sector being driven from renewables. Uh, Dean, I don't know if you had uh, something specific from a cloud perspective you would want to add here. Yeah, I think that there is definitely risk there, but I think that there is ways that can, don't, don't shoot me, right? I think there are ways that, that, that it can be adopted in secure ways that actually promote engineering 
uh, I'll say safety, preventative maintenance, things of this, of this nature. When I've been in the field recently, I've seen cloud being used for monitoring. HMIs probably in the cloud might be a different story for some organizations, but monitoring may make sense when you have low staff and things of this nature. By no means am I saying go jump to the cloud right now. There's risks that we need to understand. And here's what I'd say is that we've we've have folks in IT that we know and they know us and and in talking with IT about cloud generally about the risks and the things they've gone through a great conversation because they know what cloud is they've done cloud before we can actually learn from what they've done and deploy where it makes sense and adapt it to the control systems over time so there's a whole asterisk there right don't just go put your ICS in the cloud there's elements uh, as we might progress through where vendors might offer things that could help always with an engineering risk assessment. I think that's my main main component on that one, Tim. Yeah, I, in general, this is a, a broad topic that yep. one day I, I hope to, uh, to to deliver a five-day course specifically on industrial uh, cloud architecture and uh, detection and defense and response and operations. Um, that is something that we would need to assemble and build and really kind of learn from people who've been practitioners in the space and implemented solutions and why they chose to go certain paths and what the benefits were from an operations, from a regulatory, from a cybersecurity perspective. Um, we are definitely in a place where the default answer of no needs to at least be talked about a little bit further um, to understand how, because there are implementations where it would improve uh, a number of those things from a regulatory to operations to compliance and security, depending on how big or how small the organization is. Um, as we look to supply chain, this is something that from a software and hardware integrity perspective from a third party and remote access, and more importantly, from a pandemic perspective, we've started to see the impacts of global supply chains and the availability of resources and even how we do work from a uh, kind of remote perspective in critical infrastructure, we are doing things now in ways we would have never allowed before. And kind of our reliance on that global supply chain and what it does and its its risk and impacts is, is growing constantly. As you look to some sectors and some parts of the world, they have tried to create some regulation and some approaches to manage it. But um, knowing they are just dealing with the supply chain risks and problems of the past, and there's much, much more to do, this is going to be an ever-increasing uh, risk that needs to be managed, and we're certainly going to see that throughout 2024. Um, Dean and I have both talked a lot about ICS uh, incident response maturity. I think one of the key things to point out here, and we'll talk about it with the five critical controls as well, is if you are at an organization and you have an incident response plan, um, number one, if you're a critical infrastructure and you have OT uh, facilities and um, operations, if you believe that an IT-based IR plan is going to save the day when bad things happen, uh, I can assure you it's not going to be very helpful. If you have a general OT plan that is just signed off by different people, but it doesn't have specific actions to take that may differ from one facility or one part of your process to the next, you really, really need to work through that in exercises and edit and adjust it based on what you do, the behaviors you take, and the things you learn. And with certainty, the main focus should be on safing the process. So taking actions immediately that even if there's a successful cyber attack, what things are in your OT incident response plan that will help defend the system, protect the system, and limit the effect of a successful cyber attack? Your IR plan needs to start there in limiting the impact. Uh, we'll talk about it a little bit more as we get into the five critical controls, as it is the number one recommendation we would make is make sure you have built a OT specific IR plan and you are testing it. Uh, the last item on the list, uh, regulation. As I started there, let me just end there with this will differ based on where you are in the world and what sector you're in. But there are certainly a lot of regulatory efforts moving forward currently. Um, and the piece that I would highlight here is regardless of whether you're affected by any of those directly as an organization or in the country you're in, the vendors that you are using are likely selling into a space where regulation is becoming more dominant. So while the electric sector in North America has been going through this for two decades, 
who they buy from, uh, they have to add features and capabilities to products. People elsewhere in the world and in other sectors also buy those same products. So this is definitely something where you're going to see movement from the vendor side, even if you're not directly impacted by the regulation. Dean, anything to add there? Nothing. I think you nailed it there, my friend. Um, I'll go to the next slide if you're cool with that. I am. That was Dean being polite that we're running out of time. <laughs> Canadians. Canadians. <laughs> so really quickly on the incident response, again, just please, 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 a, uh, as we sort of look through these five critical controls, um, myself and Robert M. Lee, we were looking for what, how do we capture what we've been seeing as we go out and work with various companies, various countries, and walk through the the question that continues to come up from leadership and organizations and nations. And the question is, just tell me what to do. Meaning they see a stack of standards. They see a stack of uh, requirements from other regulatory bodies. They see NIST, they see all these frameworks and they say, we can't do it all. And we're never gonna get it done if we're starting from that perspective. So what type of program should we build that we can actually go and fund and pursue and see results from? Rob and I immediately turned and looked at the CIS 18, top 18 critical controls, formerly the 20 critical controls. And we looked at those and said, are there things we could peel out of this and say, these two or three things matter from an OT perspective? And as we looked at those 18 controls, again, we kind of understood the What's really important here in IT and OT is understanding and highlighting the difference in that first letter of those, those acronyms. From the, the, they're both technology, but one is more on the data side and one is more on the process side and trying to identify which controls would matter. And we ended up having to create kind of five new that were important. We organized them based on uh, what we believe is priority. However, how that lays into a company will depend on where they're currently at. If they already have a very well-defined OT IR plan that they exercise twice, three times a year with realistic scenarios, then they can mark that off and move on. They don't need to go back and do it again because we ranked it number one. But looking through these five, the ICS incident response, again, just the need for something that is OT specific. The one that I think is most nebulous is the defensible architecture, meaning this is 100% dependent on where you currently are, and it's 100% dependent on what is your process? What is the architecture? What is, What are you trying to defend? And it includes a lot of things, the, the traditional words of, do you know what you have? Do you know what you're operating from an inventory and an asset identification capability? Do you know what protocols are in use? Do you do you understand this, how, how to segment and where to segment so you can do collection and sensors and aggregation and you can do areas of separation if a attack is detected? And if you architect and behave that way, ensuring that the process that you're trying to defend is not impacted based on what you're doing, the actions that you're taking, you don't wanna be the, uh, the cause of some uh, equipment failures or impacts. So that defensible architecture is really something for your teams to come together on and start talking about what is the process? What is the engineered process that is under control that you are trying to defend? And how could you build a defensible architecture that gives you the necessary insights to take actions and help support that process um, even during an attack? Dean, I know this is the thing that you uh, talk about quite a bit uh, in class. Uh, over the last uh, series of workshops we've been conducting, it's come up a lot. Anything you would add here? I think that you're right. I think that from a, a sliding scale of cybersecurity perspective, if you architect things properly, it aligns you up very well for things like visibility passively that's going to be safe for your environment. So, uh, I mean, I don't want to number these, but having an instant response plan and knowing the gaps is fantastic. We got to have that. As you mentioned, IT is not the same as ICS. But if you build a proper architecture, naturally, when you do a different zone or segment, as you're doing that, you'll have a way to do collection of data. So whether it's a firewall or managed switch, that aligns you perfectly for ICS visibility monitoring and asset identification, and dare I say, vulnerability kinds of assessment information as well. So I think that 
there's a lot of effort that should be put into those understanding if they're done properly first and then making sure that you know about the basement in your foundation of your house is built strong uh, but i cannot argue with you all of these five they're all number one right like they're all <laughs> extremely important <laughs> they they do end up like a uh, less like a waffle where you go from box to box to box <laughs> yeah. and more like a bowl of spaghetti or pasta, as, as Dean would say. Yeah. You, they all tie together, touch each other, interweave. Yeah. And defensible architecture, as you're focused on that and you're identifying what you're going to do, one of the outcomes of that discussion may include adding industrial control system network visibility and monitoring capabilities, yeah. Yeah. which here is the third. But as I just stated, they're all a bowl of pasta and they're all touching each other in some way or another. Similar to secure remote access. Um, ideally, Rob and I, when we were talking through these, we wanted to put a different control there. But if you look at threat informed real world case studies, things that are happening and impacting industrial control systems, this is an area that we need dedicated focus. This is not meant to be a, uh, a concrete list that never changes. This is meant to be something that over the next year, over the next two or three years, we may identify that, hey, the community is getting it. Industry's got it. They're working with vendors. They're they're working with their IT teams. They're, they are handling this and secure remote access is solved. Um, we're not there currently. And we will continue to see industrial control system attacks that are successful because of uh, remote access, remote connectivity, third party direct access into a process we will still continue to see that happening around the world as an area of concern. It's why we have it on here as our fourth control. The last item is uh, risk-based vulnerability management. Don't think of this as your patch management program. It may very well include that for some of your assets, but from an industrial control system perspective, for those of you who are not subscribing to the CISA alerts and kind of the vulnerability details that get released, that is a constant hum of activity that is just there day to day, uh, week to week, month to month, year over year. If you're looking to get a name for yourself and find some zero day vulnerabilities, <laughs> welcome to the industrial control system community <laughs> because you could sit down at a desk with a device and start throwing malformed packets at it and start looking at how it responds and you will begin to identify issues. From a defender perspective, these devices, uh, while a whole bunch of vulnerabilities may exist and then eventually patches come out, many of them require an adversary to have access to the device, meaning they have access to the network, meaning the vulnerability that's being reported does not get them any net new capabilities. If they have access to the device and access to the network, they can simply direct the device to do what they want it to do. They don't need a host of vulnerabilities to go build exploits towards. Access is the vulnerability. So running around and patching all of your systems for every single vulnerability is likely in an industrial control system world, putting the process at greater risk than the discovered vulnerability left unpatched. So this is an area again, where securing around the process, securing around the devices and running a vulnerable uh, risk-based vulnerability management program is key. There may very well be some vulnerabilities and some exploits discovered in the wild that provide adversaries unique, novel, bespoke, kind of exquisite, cap exquisite capabilities that they can't achieve in any other way. And when those occur, then you may legitimately need to consider what does a patch program look like in an active live process and how can you achieve it and do it. But that needs to be part of a broader risk-based vulnerability management program, not just patching. Dean, any comments there? Uh, actually, I'm going to use that excellent point as a pivot into the next section of this presentation. We got a few minutes left here, which is great. But if anybody has any questions, please drop those in the comments area. We're going to address those as we go through. As Tim mentioned, all of those five kind of critical controls, they're all number one right now. But what I want to focus on now is the question that we get a lot, which is this idea of what is living off the land. Going back to the fifth control that Tim talked about was that risk-based vulnerability management. Is it a good idea to patch your ICS every 30 days? Look, you do an IT. IT does an amazing job of that. We suggest IT should not change that. 
from an ICS perspective, I want to echo Tim's comments. Doing that in the ICS every three days likely can introduce more risk to the process and to safety in doing so. And here is why we think that's the case. Living off the land, what does it mean for our cybersecurity teams who have to deal with exploitation and patching? So living off the land is this idea, you know, going from what Tim has mentioned to the adversary group that look and get access to your control system. And they absolutely abuse what's already there. Let me translate that. Generally, uh, there's not this large kind of toolkit of additional malware like you'd see in IT. There absolutely is ICS targeted malware like Tim mentioned before, which is increasing in our risk for 2024 and beyond. But the idea of things that we have already in the ICS that the uh, uh, threat group can take advantage of, like software components, hardware components, we're likely going to see this living off the land, abusing the control system against itself, increasing uh, in 2024 and beyond. And here is why we think that's the case. Now, I'm not suggesting before we get into this too far, like I'm not saying don't patch your ICS, but what we're saying is have a risk-based approach. And I'll talk about probability in a moment as we go through. Generally, living off the land can present an opportunity for an adversary group that is much cheaper for the adversaries to deploy that kind of an approach versus kit and gear and a whole bunch of different exploits if they find them uh, in, or if they find vulnerabilities inside of the ICS. And the reason is, is if you take and look at some of the things that are available in the ICS, like the human machine interface that controls your process or an engineering workstation that can reprogram your programmable logic controllers, the adversary is using what's already there. It's going to be harder for us to detect that, but also in general, it might provide higher attack success rate. And if they do have access to those things and they have access to your ICS without the use of malware in many cases, they can directly use those tools to have a direct impact on safety and engineering uh, as, we go, as we go through. Now, where have we seen these categories of threats? Obviously, getting access, as Tim mentioned, is critical. So leveraging valid credentials in an environment is one way they can get access. So pivoting from IT to ICS, where there's nearly 40% of control system uh, events today or incidents come from an IT environment allowing the threat into the ICS. So pivoting using credentials from one environment to the other is absolutely what they've continued to do. And we think that will be uh, in 2024 and beyond. Also injecting ICS network protocols specifically, pretending to be an HMI as an example, and sending those ICS controls in commands in deep packets out to field devices, such as a programmable logic controller or to you. That's another way as well to abuse the, the idea of what's already in the environment. Abusing scripting capabilities as well, but I really wanna focus on the last two more so, which is, engineering controls and applications of those controls, the HMI, human machine interface, and using that. Generally, if there's a vulnerability on that device, it's a great idea to patch it when it makes sense to do so. However, the adversary likely will not need an exploit uh, to be uh, uh, even used in that environment if they have direct access to the HMI. So here's the thing. We get this as well all the time. Are we seeing adversaries now shifting away from exploiting engineering hardware and software and systems and vulnerabilities, just focusing on what we'll say it's easier for the adversary that living off the land attack techniques. And so AKA the question can be boiled down to, should we patch the ICS moving forward or like who cares? So <laughs> before I jump in, right, it's absolutely important. We need to, of course, patch the control system. But here's where I want to get into the nuance of this really quickly. So we need to patch the control system, but we should expect a blend of attacks. Expect a blend of attacks where the adversaries are using exploitation of different vulnerabilities and living off the land. Scripting using PowerShell, getting access to HMIs, engineering workstations, etc. So it's important to continue to patch. But we also need to kind of, uh, I'll say, compare is it important to patch a system when there's downtime required? And can we can we focus on the effort of if an adversary gets access to your environment and if they find a vulnerability and what's the probability to then exploiting that vulnerability after testing the exploit and then deploying pre-positioned exploit and then having an exploit being achieved and then escalating 
some kind of access to follow-on objectives. So again, just to summarize here, living off the land is abusing the control system against itself. And the idea is that we definitely want to continue patching, but we predict patching is important, but there's also going to be this blend of exploitation of vulnerabilities that exist in control systems coupled with that idea of living off the land. That's really the crux of what we're saying here in this particular case. And what can help, as Tim mentioned, is all of those five controls, right? Those The, the five controls of ICS, that pasta, uh, that's going to be helpful to you in your control system. So um, with that, uh, I think right now I'm going to pass it back to Tim. Do you have anything else to close us out at this particular point, Tim? Well, I believe we are over time. So <laughs> I'd like to thank everybody for being here. <laughs> and joining us this has been a blast dean it's always a pleasure to listen and uh hear your input i think um a, a number of the questions that came through uh i hope we addressed but i don't know if we have time to uh highlight any individual questions i saw some on uh what about icmp that is uh <laughs> that is a very important tool in the industrial control system space that is used to leverage and verify that our assets are up and talking but uh, based on some of the targeted attacks that have occurred from uh, security tools and uh, network monitoring and, and the like, just making sure the people on the OT side, the industrial control system side, understand how those types of tools that we've purchased and employed for security, they could be used against us um, from uh, an attacker perspective as we add all the different uh, perimeter rules and access of different protocols in to talk and monitor our devices understand that those tools and those uh, pathways through our defensible uh, network, they're not just there for us to use, they're also there for adversaries to leverage as well. Um, yep. Fantastic. Again, tying into uh, to Dean's point of living off the land, doing everything you can from an adversary perspective to blend in, use the tools, use the technology that's there to operate the environment, but uh, for your case to use it to misoperate the environment. This is great, Tim. I think we have uh, one quick uh, a section where Brian Ventura is going to talk about some misconfigurations that are out there that introduce risk. So I'll pass it back over to the uh, the folks on on, uh, on our back end here, and we'll hear from Brian Ventura in a moment. You mean we don't get to go away? <laughs> we have Welcome one back. minute. This is Brian Ventura, and I've been with you a couple episodes now talking about an NSA and CISA document that came out. Red and blue teams share top 10 cybersecurity misconfigurations. I introduced it a little bit myself, and then we talked with Phil Hagen about uh, some of the network component sides. But now we're going to talk to uh, Andrew about his perspectives of it from a defensive um, standpoint. A little bit of background real quick. Myself, I'm Brian Ventura, and I am a SANS instructor, been with SANS for about eight years, been in the IT industry for like 30 years, but focused on cybersecurity this last decade, um, do consulting and uh, assessments and helping people build these programs. I'm also the course author for uh, the CIS controls, SEC 566. Uh, so uh, you may see me around that way as well. And that's what I talked about in the beginning of this. So if you want to go back a couple episodes, I talked about how it ties into the CIS controls. But for now, let us um, let me introduce Andrew and let him take over and have a conversation from his perspective. Andrew? Hey, Brian, how are you? Um, good to see you. Um, hey, my name is Andy Lehman. Uh, I am a course author and instructor for SANS, uh, SEC 503, Network Monitoring and Threat Detection, uh, as well as um, I have been in the IT industry, uh, security and on the IT side both for, oh gosh, an embarrassing 30 plus years now at this stage. So um, uh, I guess I, I, I can I can talk on uh, Brian's first episode on this topic with the grayness showing up here now. That's kind of embarrassing. But anyway, um, I am really excited uh, about this document uh, from the perspective of what is highlighted in uh, the document is many of the fundamental items that we should be covering um, from not only a security perspective, but also from an IT perspective within our organizations. There's been many, many great um, 
frameworks and documents over the years that have highlighted these things. And we seem to sometimes lose focus on these, especially when uh, newer, uh, more advanced uh, detection uh, prevention techniques and uh, technologies come out. For example, right now, artificial intelligence, machine learning is all the buzz, which is amazing. But we've got to be sure that before we start going down that path, we look at the things uh, that are highlighted in this, for example, like patch management is huge and there's a lot of cases where we do amazing job at patching uh, our server side even our host our client systems but we can't forget that we also need to be sure that we're patching and looking at our network monitoring systems we're patching our security products our firewalls our routers, our switches. We also need to take into account that many, many products with whatever term you want to call them, building control systems and uh, IoT stuff, um, uh, OT technologies, a lot of those technologies are um, um, also have operating systems and software on them. And we need to include those in our patching and our monitoring process which also then plays into what Phil was talking about, about having proper segmentation and, and working and looking at that. We need to be sure that the products that are on our networks are the systems that need to be on our networks and that we have visibility into that and that we know what those systems are. We also, especially with the cloud environments, need to be sure that we're uh, patching or at least the systems or the applications that we're using are being patched and managed from that perspective. That also applies into some of the other uh, items that they list, for example, access to those systems, uh, you know, uh, access control lists, making sure that the right systems have access to those systems um, through authentication methods, right? Um, poor user proper, uh, poor user authentication and user authentication methods. Uh, are we using multi-factor authentication message? Do we have good credential hygiene? Are we making sure that we're doing uh, things like not sharing accounts and uh, having proper controls around those accounts? Uh, system administrators have separate accounts to do their user type of work, reading their emails and whatever it happens to be, but not necessarily doing that same account to do their system administration type of work. So what I, it really excites me that these, uh, you know, continually remind us that, uh, you know, one, security is not just a security team's responsibility. It is the whole organization's responsibility to be sure that we're covering all of these fundamental controls before we start trying to take off and doing more advanced things. Oh, I think I think I got you muted there by accident, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> I did mute myself just to make sure I didn't butt in. Um, but, oh, you're fine. <laughs> but but you do bring up some really good uh, points there with uh, with what you were talking about, and definitely thinking about the patching and uh, uh, as a core component before we can get to those more advanced things, uh, artificial intelligence and stuff. But the artificial intelligence that's what's in my face because that's what the vendors are talking about. That's what's interesting to talk about. So that's all we hear about until we kind of dive dive in and think about this stuff and look at documents like this to to get those more important components. So yeah, I, I agree with you. Yeah, and it's a great it's great that you know there's it's great that it highlights it and kind of helps us focus back in. Hey, that's amazing. Um, have we checked all these boxes yeah. and can we do these things that we should be doing well? Agreed. And we use that word foundational, but I don't know if we, I don't always think about the idea that the foundation holds everything up. That's why we call it that. And if you don't have good patching, you don't have good access control, you don't have good segmentation, but you have amazing artificial intelligence and other things, the attacker's still going to get in. You might figure it out faster because your AI figured it out, but you're still breached, and that's not a great place to be. So I like, I like yeah, and that plays into now. exactly what Phil was talking about to make sure that not only if we, are we doing these things, but our environment is forensically ready to be able to do detection. Because while prevention is amazing, if we don't detect, we can't respond. Yeah. So. Yeah, and detection's expensive, so we don't like spending money there. So, but yeah, still, <laughs> you're right. <laughs> because uh, detection is us. We got to have people there right now. The artificial intelligence not quite there to do a hundred percent of this, and people are expensive. Buying a firewall, buying a preventative control, cheap. I just buy it. It's a hundred thousand dollars. I set it. I forget about it. Sure, I got to care and feed it, but not as expensive as that person that wants a salary every day, every month, every every year. Oh my gosh. <laughs> So, yeah. People. Well, thank They're you amazing. for the conversation. Uh, any closing comments? 
No, I look forward to hearing how uh, Tim is taking advantage of some of these things next uh, next week as well. Yeah, good point. So we, we do have one more session. I'm going to meet with Tim Medine, and we're going to talk about it from the red team perspective. So what do the attackers see? Are they leveraging these things? And if they're not, then why are we talking about them? That's kind of the conversation there. Um, that will be live, though. So Tim and I will have a conversation live, so you can put in some comments and things like that, ask us some questions. So looking forward to that one. Uh, stay tuned and uh, check you out at the next episode. Thanks. Tim All right, Medine fantastic. Live. So we're going to close this episode down. A <laughs> lot of information there from Brian Ventura as well uh, as Andy there. So great information from the IT side as well. Just to kind of recap, and I'll pass it over to Tim in a moment. We've just ran you through five things that we should consider for industrial control systems at the utmost for any sector in any region for your control systems. Now we know that we predict there's gonna be increased living off the land as a trend. Ransomware is also not going away. I wanna make sure we mention that ransomware can also impact traditional operating systems in your ICS. That's continuing to increase as we're seeing as of late as well. So I definitely appreciate you guys being here. Uh, Tim, any last comments as we kind of exit here? Just, uh, I think from a industrial control system perspective, for those of you who are uh, joining us and listening from that side of the house, um, we all have the uniqueness of each facility, each company, each process that we operate has some uh, unique characteristics to it that uh, the asset owner knows and should have the upper hand from a defense perspective as an adversary has to come in and sort of learn that environment if they wish to misuse it. They wish to uh, kind of live off the land and blend in. Taking advantage of that and sort of your upper hand to detect, your upper hand to respond the, uh, the phrase you've heard from ICS, from SANS, is defense is doable. You've heard that for years and years and years, and we, we absolutely support that and live by it. But uh, it's doable if you have trained people that know uh, what options they have and know how to defend the system. And really investing in your personnel is key. But beyond that, not just going out and getting new hires, not just going out and looking for people who have the skill set partnering with the IT side of your organizations and and utilizing the skills that may already exist there as you're looking at a new distributed control system that may have active directory integration and may have a number of features that traditional instrumentation and control and process engineers may not be familiar with, um, rather than training and training and training to make them something additional, uh, leverage what you already have. Uh, really encouraging kind of the IT and the OT teams to work together as much as humanly possible from an org, from a culture perspective. Um, if you've heard kind of the IT and OT convergence words uh, from a technology perspective, that happened 20, 25 years ago. From a organizational and cultural perspective, that is something we are all actively pursuing and working. Um, we need to do much better. Our adversaries are. Awesome, Tim. Thanks very much, everybody. Have a great day and hope to see you in class at some point learning about control systems and defending what makes the world work. Thanks so much. Have a great day. Thank you.